You create your life with the stories you tell yourself. Want more fun, love, and money? Then write your new story and live into it. Louis DiBianco's podcast, Change Your Story, Change Your Life, shows you how to discover your empowering story. You'll meet many successful people who have created magnificent lives, even when the odds were stacked against them. Plus, you'll learn the secrets of great storytelling that can explode your business. And now, here is your host, Louis DiBianco. Sometimes truth is stranger and more dramatic than fiction. Today's guest is a man whose true life events were portrayed in a Hollywood film. It was a work of fiction based on his harsh truth. The movie is called Felon. It stars Val Kilmer, Stephen Dorff, Fan Archer, and Sam Shepard. It's a hard-hitting movie, very engaging, but the truth behind it is tougher and worse. Think of it this way. The movie depicts a fender bender. The real-life story is a head-on fatal collision. Hello, storytellers, and welcome once again to another episode of Change Your Story, Change Your Life. I'm your host, Louis DiBianco. I'm excited that our sponsor is Audible because they give us the opportunity to enrich our lives with books. As you know, I'm a firm believer that readers are leaders, and you can get a downloadable free audiobook of your choice from Audible. You can choose from 180,000 titles and get a month free trial of all of Audible service by going today to www.audibletrial.com forward slash story power. I'm always looking for ways to evolve this show. I've recently introduced the one-word story episodes, short episodes, and I'm getting great feedback about those. I will definitely continue them. Also, continue to let me know the things that you would love to see in this show, perhaps things that I never even thought about, and I will do my best to incorporate them into Change Your Story, Change Your Life. Keep sending your comments and questions to loseclub at gmail.com, L-O-U-S-C-L-U-B at gmail.com. Earlier, I called the real-life story of today's guest a head-on collision. The man who lived through and survived that collision is Richard Caruso a proud former Marine who later became a prison guard at Corcoran Prison, considered by many to be the deadliest prison in America. One of the inmates was Charles Manson. Caruso witnessed violent corruption at Corcoran. He stood up against it as a whistleblower and endangered his own life. His courageous stand made history and ended the unjust violence at Corcoran. Richard Caruso has appeared on 60 Minutes with Mike Wallace, CBS Evening News with Dan Rather, CNN, Justice Files, and other well-known news programs. Get ready for some straight talk from the real deal, Richard Caruso. Richard, welcome to Change Your Story, Change Your Life. Thank you, though. Thank you for inviting me and uh, taking interest in my story. Well, uh, I would say it's kind of hard not to take an interest in your story. Um, it's more gripping than most dramatic movies. Now, Richard, where were you born? I was born in a small town in upstate New York, um, right outside of Rochester, New York, called Hornell, New York, to a big Italian family. Big Italian family. How big? Uh, we had eight, eight kids in my family. My dad, uh, he was a... Uh, Hard-working man. He, he he drove a beer delivery truck during the day, but in the evening he was a uh, he was a bookie, and uh, he he ran numbers, and he he had clients from the local sheriff to the judges to everybody loved my father in that area in upstate New York. Sounds like a really colorful background, my friend. 
Really colorful. Who would you say influenced you the most when you were a child? Uh, well, I would say my father influenced me the most because uh, he, he, he'd give you the shirt off his back. I mean, as, as a lot of well-known uh, Italian men, I mean, you're, you know, you're Italian and you know that a lot of our mentors and men in our lives, would they give you the shirt off the back. But one bad quality that I think I picked up from him is I give you the shirt off my back, but if you cross me, then, you know, I'm done with you. And uh, sometimes you can't have that attitude, and people deserve a second chance. And But I, I think my father was uh, the biggest mentor in my life. I can hear the affection in your voice. That's wonderful. Did you have a childhood dream, Richard, of what you wanted to be when you grew up? I wanted to be a police officer. Um, I always wanted to get into law enforcement. But unfortunately, uh, in the state of New York, you had to be 21 to be a police officer. So... You know, I decided to go in the Marine Corps, in which uh, I was going to turn 19 to boot camp. I went to Paris Island, South Carolina when I was 18. I turned 19 to boot camp. And uh, after boot camp, I went to San Antonio, Texas, to military police school and uh, became a military policeman in the United States Marine Corps. Now, what would you say attracted you to the military? Well, I mean, uh, my father's brother was a United States Marine who fought in Guadalcanal. And my father always idolized his brother, and uh, he always respected the military. And um, so I, uh, one day I, one day I was got in an argument with my dad, and I was a pretty well-known athlete in the small bubble that I lived in in upstate New York. And uh, I got in an argument, and I said, you know what, I'm going to go down and join the Marine Corps when, you know, he thought I was going to go to college and play basketball. So I went down and uh, I took the testing and the ASVAB and I, I went through the process and I signed up for what was called the delayed entry program, and uh, which meant I had like nine months until I had to go. Once I graduated high school, after nine months, and I would go to boot camp. Well, the nine months went by. I excelled in sports. I was in the papers. I started getting offers in colleges to go to play basketball, and I kind of forgot. That, uh, I, that, that I that I that I signed the on the dotted line to join the Marine Corps, and after I graduated high school, nine months later, I was laying up in my room, and uh, I was watching TV, and I heard a knock on the door, and I opened the door, and it was the Marine Corps recruiter. And he said, "You're going to Paris Island today, Richard," and I looked at him and I said, "No, I go, I'm not going to Paris Island. I'm not going to the Marines. I just did it. I signed those papers because I was in an argument with my dad." Well, my father was at the bottom of the stairs and said, if you sign that contract, if you don't go, you're a coward. And I said, Dad, did you just call me a coward? He goes, that's right. You you signed that contract, and if you don't go, you're a coward. So I got my clothes on, and I put my shoes on, and they put me on a Greyhound bus and shipped me to Buffalo, New York. From Buffalo, I flew to Atlanta, Georgia. From Atlanta, Georgia, I took a bus to Paris Island, South Carolina. And I uh, arrived there at about 2 in the morning with the smell of swamps and sand fleas in the air in 1982, October of 1982. Paris Island is a tough place, man. I've yeah, heard... Especially, I've, for a Jew, huh? especially for a juvenile who thinks he knows it all, and then when he gets there, he realizes he doesn't know much. <laughs> wow. Now, you were working, you said uh, you became a, a military policeman. Did, did you see any military action? Well, Beirut happened and, uh, when I was in, so we were on standby to go to Beirut and then Panama, but we never got deployed. I was overseas. I, went, I was in Japan, Korea, on the DMZ. I was in the Philippines, and uh, I was all over the world as a military policeman, and I ended my service as a military policeman in Yuma, Arizona. You eventually went on to be a prison guard. Why did you choose that? Well, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I was going to go back to New York State, and I was going to be a state trooper. But in California, uh, in the mid-'80s, there was a prison boom, and they were paying uh, correctional officers out in California. I mean, with a little overtime, you were making six figures in the 80s. So, I mean, you you were between eighty and $100,000 a year in 1986. That was a lot of money. 
So that attracted me to go into the prison, you know, to work inside the prisons out in California. So I took the test and uh, I got hired at my first prison, which was called Mule Creek State Prison. It was a brand new prison. It was level three outside of Sacramento in Ione, California. And um, that was in 1987. But it was a, it was a medium security prison with probably about 5,000 inmates at the time and uh it, it just wasn't satisfying enough for me i wanted to be i wanted to be with the worst of the worst and uh i heard rumors that they were building this prison down outside of uh, fresno california called corcoran state prison and what they were going to do is they for years in, in the in in the prisons of san quentin tehachapi and Folsom, in the maximum security areas of these prisons when these inmates would go to yard, these inmates in those prisons would be segregated. So the blacks would go out with the blacks, the whites with the whites, and the Mexicans with the Mexicans. Well, they were going to build this prison called Corcoran, and they were going to have the yards the size of handball courts. And they were going to bring all those inmates down from those three prisons and house them in Corcoran, black, white, Mexican, black, white, Mexican. And they were going to put these inmates out on these handball courts size yards and they were going to integrate them and mix them up so i was eager to go down there and um experience act the activation of this new maximum security prison which was called the shoe security housing unit and uh i was uh motivated to be part of the activation team in 1989. you said you wanted to be at the worst of the worst why well i mean i was young dumb and you know full of energy coming out of the Marine Corps. It was all about kicking ass and taking names. I was in my early 20s. Um, I, I thought I could make a difference, and uh, I was a crime fighter. At least I thought I was a crime fighter at the time. Um, I was just eager to get my hands dirty and, and, and dive into the criminal justice system and, and uh, try to make a difference in somebody's life. Uh, little did I know that, you know, some of these inmates are just... Uh, you know, that, that's all they know is crime. And uh, I, I really wasn't educated in what I was about to encounter walking inside the, those walls of that prison in which, you know, you had the worst of the worst, but you also had nonviolent drug, drug offenders that uh, basically uh, didn't commit violent crimes but were caught with drugs and now were being incarcerated. So I also, I also encountered uh, the prisons in California almost like a warehouse to where, you know, they were locking these guys up. They had drug problems and throwing away the key on them. So describe your experience in Corker in the first six months. I mean, what you went with one image in your mind and then you probably experienced some kind of uh, immediate shock when you got there. Well, when I got to Corcoran, I mean, it was like a, it was like a war zone because now they were integrating these gang members that were once segregated in those other prisons that I talked about earlier. And so twice a day they would run the yard at 8 in the morning and at 1 in the afternoon. So if you walked outside your building at 8 in the morning and you got to figure there were 20 buildings, uh, you would hear gunshots going off all over the place because – these inmates were immediately fighting on the yard because they were being integrated now. So I, I was like, I was, uh, I had a wow factor. Like, this is what I've always asked for to be here with the worst of the worst. And, uh, as a big guy, I'm six foot four, 280 pounds. I kept being used in the most violent situations inside that atmosphere from cell extractions in which I would be the shield man to, uh, handling, uh, uh, inmates who were murdered or, uh, you know, uh, violent uh, altercations. And I was always, and I was getting closer to that inner circle of uh, trusted uh, guards that were being used in the utmost violent situations. And uh, so I guess uh, the moral to that story is be careful what you wish for, because I definitely got it. What did you love and hate about working in Corcoran? Well, obviously, the, the money was excellent. Um, I, I enjoyed the money. And coming out of the Marine Corps, it, 
the small town that uh, I lived in by Corcoran was Hanford, California. And uh, there was three or four other prisons around that town. So everybody that lived in that town had some kind of association to the California Department of Corrections or to the prison system. So I kind of liked that family atmosphere that, you know, you were, they were your family. And you, you could walk into the supermarket and, you know, it was everybody that worked in the system and, you know, we took care of each other. So um, I, I like that camaraderie. I like that family uh, feeling. Um, what I didn't like is uh, basically uh, the, uh, the violence that uh, resulted in the deaths there at Corcoran. I felt it could be avoided. And once I started seeing the inmates, uh, certain inmates being set up and uh, killed, that's when I tried to stop the violence. Mm, we're going to get into that. Yes, that's powerful stuff. Now, how, how did you protect your mind and your heart because you were basically in a very toxic world? Well, and that's, that's exactly true. And, you know, it's almost like, you know, being in the Marine Corps, a lot of people ask me if I deal with PTSD. And I tell them I don't deal with PTSD from my military service. I deal with PTSD from what I saw inside prison and the violence that I've seen inside prison walls. And uh, I, I feel that you try to condition your mind to leave the job you know, they're at work at, at the prison, but, you know, lots of times, it, it, you know, if you see a man get decapitated with a 100-pound dumbbell on the weight pile who had been laying down and another inmate came up and, and threw a 100-pound dumbbell down on his head and it decapitated him, it's hard to get that image out of your head. Wow. And, uh, you, 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 I, you, I, you, I obvi you obviously saw that. Yes. I mean, and so... I mean, I'm standing next to inmates, and they've been shot and shot in the head, and you know, so it's 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 hard to get. It's a, it's a war zone, you know, and it's just you know, it, being in traumatic situations like that, it's hard to get those images out of your head. So once I got out of the system, I was very callous to society, very callous to the public. You know, I, I didn't trust many people, and it took me years to get over that, to get over the hump, to. Uh, not put a broad brush on people to think that everybody was bad or mm. everybody wanted something from me or wow. everybody was a gender driven. Yeah. Wow, that, that's powerful. Richard, for the benefit of our listeners, please define PTSD. Post traumatic stress disorder. Ah, uh, okay. And what it is is basically when you're dealing, I mean, you can have PTSD from a, a car accident that, you know, was uh, very traumatic. Any traumatic event uh, that you've experienced in life, it could be as a child. You know, they used to call it shell shock uh, for veterans that came back from war, and now it's just been redefined as uh, PTSD. And uh, it's basically any kind of trauma that you've experienced in your life, and having those reoccurring images or you know, hearing a bang out in society, a backfire of a car, and you're flinching, and or you're always looking over your shoulder because, you know, you you're having a flashback of being in that setting or that, you know, environment. It's like being in a plane crash and surviving the plane crash, and then having to fly again on another plane. It's mm -hmm. not going to be the same. You're you're going to have um, reservations of put, being back in that same scenario. Mm hmm. Now. Did you actually get to know Charlie Manson? I took care of him. I took care of him for over five years. Um, everybody wants to know about Charlie. I have many stories about Charlie and, you know, uh, some of the stuff that he did. But uh, what I tell people is that Charles Manson never personally killed anybody. He was a coward. He grew up in the juvenile system in California. His mother was a prostitute. He was raped and he was sexually abused when he was in prison in, in the youth authority. So by the time he got to the adult prison out in California, he was uh, he was damaged goods and uh, he was raised as a con. So once he hit the streets of Hate and Ashbury in San Francisco, he was just another con coming out of prison that you know basically 
uh, were embraced by the hippie movement out there, and he worked it. He worked the system. He worked his uh, manipulated behavior on them. But uh, to me, he was a, he was a coward who never looked in the camera and never took responsibility for anything. And he always blamed somebody else. And he always blamed those kids for uh, the crimes out there. I would talk to him in length about the crimes, and he, he would call me Paisan. He always tried to find a common ground with you as a form of manipulation. So he knew my last name was Caruso, and he used to tell me that him and my father used to hang out in Chicago because he just took, he picked the city. He didn't know I was from New York. He said that him and my father used to hang out in Chicago together in the 40s and were gangsters. So he was trying to find that common ground with me to kind of work me, and I saw what he was doing. So his nickname for me was Paisan. So he would say, Paisan, I never killed anybody. I just cut a guy's ear off with dental floss. That's all I ever did. And uh, he wanted to be um, he wanted to be a rock star. And he used to hang out with uh, Dennis Wilson at the Beach Boys and party with Dennis Wilson. And he'd bring his girls over to Dennis's house. And uh, Terry Belcher, uh, Doris Day's son, was over there. And Charlie would offer the girls up to to him and he was trying to get a, a record contract, and they were promising him, uh, you know, stardom. And uh, when it didn't come through, he, you know, it turned to anger in Charlie, and uh, the rest is history. And the murders happened, but he was he was mild compared to what I had at Corcoran. I had some very, very, very bad uh, people in Corcoran State Prison, and Manson got the publicity, and that's the one that everybody wants to talk about. But they're some of the some of the men that I had in Corcoran made Manson look like like nothing. Mm. I, had, I, had a, I had a I had an inmate that went through the McDonald's drive-through and he ordered a value meal for himself. And then when he got up to the window, he said, "Can I can I please add another value meal for my wife?" And he, he reached over and he held his wife's head up to the to the drive-through window. Uh, he had cut her head off. I had some very bad people. Um, my clerk, my clerk that uh, used to type my reports, is the only man that I ever met that changed the course of history by killing one person, and that was Sirhan Sirhan. He killed Bobby Kennedy, and Sirhan was my clerk at Corker State Prison. And I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Manchurian Candidate, but yeah, yeah. to know Sirhan, to know Sirhan like I know him you would never think that he could ever hurt anybody because he was a model inmate. It was like something clicked in him and he became an assassin. But by killing Bobby Kennedy, changed the course of history because if he doesn't kill Bobby Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy becomes president and Bobby pulls everybody out of Vietnam. So by killing that one person, Sirhan Sirhan changed the whole course of history. Hmm. And you said he was a model prisoner. That, that's interesting. That is interesting. Everything, how, everything, everything was stern. Thank you, stern. Thank you. He was a model. But how did he? How did he deal with the, um, the the people who were stronger and more violent than him who wanted to probably kill him? Well, those high profile inmates are in what's called PHU, which is called the Protective Housing Unit. In California, there's only one protective housing unit for high profile inmates. And they, and they put them at Corcoran. And we got about 40 inmates in there. So Sirhan is amongst other inmates that would be targets out of the main line. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. So those inmates are, you know, they're, they're all grouped together. So they're not going to do anything to each other because basically they're all mostly high profile, you know. Is Corcoran still open? Uh, yes, it is. Corcoran is. Corcoran, is, I think the population is over 6,000 inmates in there now, and uh, there's two security housing units in California. Corcoran was the first, and then now there's Pelican Bay. So out of all the prisons, I, I think there's over 30 prisons now in California, and there's only two security housing units, and then it's at Corcoran and Pelican Bay State Prison. Describe the corruption that you saw and eventually decided to speak up about. Well, what they were doing is they were uh, staging fights between the gang members, and they would kick the inmates out of the yard, knowing that these inmates were going to fight. So 
the fights became predictable because if if uh, the two white guys in cell one went out and the two black guys in cell two, and their cellies got in a fight, well, they get on lockdown, but you know when the next time the cellmates come out, they're going to fight. Or if, the, if they were rival gang members, that you knew they were rivals, and if they got a chance to get at each other, you put them out there in that yard, they're going to have a fist fight, they're going to fight. But you have to understand, when, we talk, when we're talking fighting on these security housing yards, there's no weapons. It's all fist fights. Uh, we, look, we do what's called an unclothed body search before they go out there. We're looking up every orifice of their body, in their mouth, in their anus, everything. We're looking for everything. These inmates, they're not allowed to tape in their cell. So basically, they're going out there with flip-flops, underwear, a T-shirt, and, and a small little towel. And uh, lots of times they were warming up in their cell, doing exercises, knowing that they were going to go out there and fight. And when I was the gunner up in the booth, they would look up to me and beg me, please don't shoot me today, Caruso, because you know I have to fight. I can't go back to the cell block, you know, looking like a coward. And uh, in, in, the, uh, in the gun tower, we would have three weapons. I would be armed with a Mini-14. I would be armed with a 9 millimeter rifle that shot an explosive round. And I also had a 37 millimeter, um, which shot out a projectile, five projectiles like wooden blocks. We called them the knee knockers. So it was a less than lethal weapon. So I would always use the knee knockers, the block gun, to stop the fight. But what happened was is the fighting became so predictable, certain officers took it upon themselves and uh, started abusing the system, and inmates were getting shot and killed and there was one incident that happened, his name was inmate Preston Tate, where they put him out there on the yard, he was a black inmate, and then they put these two Hispanic inmates out there on the yard. There was an altercation, and the gunner shot in the middle of them and ended up shooting Tate's head off. Well, I wasn't there at the incident, but I heard the officers after the incident were telling me that, you know what, it was bad, it didn't happen like they wrote it down, uh, the way they re the press release from the prison wasn't really what happened. So I started digging and I went in and I got a copy of that press release. And in the press release it said that Tate was the aggressor and he went after the Mexican inmates. Well, I was told it was the it was the other way around that he was attacked. It also said there was a weapon on the yard and I was told there was no weapon. So what I needed to do is I needed to get the video of that fight so I could see what happened. So I went up and I started pilferaging through the old videotapes, and I found the video of it, and I started collecting the evidence that I knew that the report didn't match the evidence that I was looking at. So then I had all this evidence that I felt, that, you know, this, this, this inmate had gotten killed and shot by officers, and I felt that it was being covered up. And I went to my supervisor, who was uh, Lieutenant Steve Riggs, and he was a former Marine also, and I told him, I said, you know what? This, this is this is wrong. You know, what we're doing, we're putting these inmates out there. We know that they're going to get in a fight, and they, we know they're in danger, and we're creating a scenario, and then we're using lethal force to stop it. So I tried to go up my chain of command, but it was shot down and told to be quiet about it. So right there I saw that, you know what, I'm starting to ruffle feathers. It's not going to be advantageous to my career. So what I did is I started collecting more evidence and going through files and finding the other cases that I thought the abuse was happening. And I was taking uh, pictures and uh, files and incident reports and evidence out of prison, and I was stockpiling them at my house. And uh, that's when I got a hold of the FBI, and, and, I, and I let the FBI inform them of what was happening at Corcoran State Prison, and then I had the evidence at my house. Mm. And now, the moment you did that, how did your life begin to change? Well, in that environment, the worst thing you can do is be a snitch or tell on your gang or, you know, your fellow inmate. And it's almost the same kind of uh, value system within the, uh, the guards or the police uh, ranks. Um, you know, you don't tell on the person next to you. And uh, I wasn't so much a sympathizer when it came to criminals. But I, was, I would be damned if I was going to put another human being out there and shoot him just for to be part of the, 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 the brotherhood or to be part of the good old boys. 
And uh, I just stood up and refused to do it. And uh, I didn't care what the repercussions were going to be. I was not going to use lethal force to stop stand-up fist fights. So I started being ostracized by the other officers, and they were trying to put pressure on me, saying that I needed to to, to send a round down down range to at one of these inmates because basically they know when Caruso's up there on the gun that they can go out and fight, then they're not going to get shot. Well, I didn't, you know, I, I refused to shoot one of them because uh, unless they unless they were going to hurt another inmate to where they were going to stab them or if I was going to preserve another inmate's life, I had no problem shooting them to preserve life. But I wasn't going to shoot them just to get blood on my hands. I mean, what separates us from them if we're doing stuff like that? I mean, mm. it, it, it would be like me. It would be like me telling you that when you get in your car and you go up the street to that intersection, I know 100% that another car is going to hit you and you're going to get in an accident. Isn't it my isn't it my obligation just as a human being to say, hey, listen, Lewis, don't go there. Wait, wait a couple minutes for to to keep you safe. And that's exactly what was happening inside the shoe. We knew 100% if you put inmate A with inmate B and you put them out there in that little yard, there was going to be a fight based on the history of those gangs. They're like, yeah, they sound like gladiatorial games. Now, what would you say motivated many of those guards to want to do this and to enjoy it? Well, uh, this, what, what happens is when you're dealing with people in a position of authority who's not being policed by an outside agency, I mean, you can look at our the police departments around the country, you can look at uh, companies around the country, you can look at our own government. If we're not having outside agencies or outside eyes on us, unfortunately, people start letting uh, power go to their head and abuses start to happen. I mean, look at Hitler, what he did over in Germany uh, with the Jews marching them in the ovens. Once the outside eyes of the of the world were on him and we went in there and stopped it, I mean, he had killed hundreds of thousands of people. But, I mean, it's just, it's just people that get power and people that get the power and authority and not being policed um, from the outside. And, and, and lots of times power goes to people's heads. And uh, I, unfortunately, I feel that's what was happening is that you know, the qualifications to be a correctional officer at that time was only six weeks of training. So with six weeks of training, you're making almost $100,000 in the 80s, and you're basically giving the green light to, as long as you can articulate in a report, articulate, you know, that you felt great bodily injury was about to occur to that other inmate, you could shoot another human being. And, I mean, it was ludicrous to use lethal force for non-lethal fist fight. These these inmates were just in a stand up fist fight that was created by staff. You know, I hear what you're saying, but I'm thinking here you were also in there and not having outside eyes on you. But your internal makeup would not allow you to do that. And so I'm wondering about the people who start out as law enforcers who get into a very toxic world and they themselves begin to get a taste for sadism, cruelty as a way of, I don't know what, you say it's just power or is it a way of acting out how damaged they are and how small they feel inside? I think I think it inches towards, uh, you know, at first you get away with something, and then the next time you get away with something bigger, and then something bigger, and then eventually, you know, you're untouchable. And a lot of it is if you're being told that you're doing the right things by your superiors, that magnifies it to where, you know what, we're being told that this is okay. And I think the money that was being made, you know, you're getting, you're making huge money out there at the time, so... These officers, a lot of them felt that, you know what, this is what we're told to do. We're told to mix these gang members up, 
you know, the administration there at Corcoran, they were hearing the gunshots. You're talking probably uh, seven to ten gunshots a day. They were hearing it. It was like boom, 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 boom. These, these, the administration there was hearing it. Sacramento, uh, they knew about it. So I, the only thing that I could theorize why they were letting this uh, happen was because it was a prison boom. And I, I feel that what government does and what society does is they pump fear when it's time to build new prisons or build an agency like TSA that, you know, that a billion dollar agency, you know, they pump fear into the public and say, hey, you don't want that plane blowing up. We need to, we need to create a, a, another screening uh, uh, agency called TSA, or we need to pay these officers, you know, way more money because you don't want these child molesters and murderers climbing over that fence. Hear all those gunshots inside that prison? This is a violent place. And I, using fear in the public is very effective. And uh, mm. so when the public would hear this, this, these shootings and these killings, they're like, hey, pay these guys whatever they gotta got to pay them. You know, pay them whatever you got to pay them. We don't want these killers coming out into our neighborhood. But what the public didn't know is a lot of those fights and a lot of those incidents were being orchestrated by the staff. Mm. Now, you eventually formed a relationship with Mike Wallace of 60 Minutes, right? How did that come about? Well, um, I uh, when I started taking the evidence outside of Corcoran, and then I uh, aligned myself with the FBI, I got a call from the Los Angeles Times from a reporter named Mark Arax. And Mark Arax convinced me that, you know what, I needed to tell my story. And uh, there was power in telling my story because he said, Richard, he goes, I know who you are. He said, but if something happens to you or if you turn the key on your vehicle and it explodes, the public's not going to know who you are. So I told my story on the front cover, uh, the front page of the L.A. Times back in 1994. And after that, I was uh, contacted by a producer for 60 Minutes named Lowell Bergman. Now, Lowell Bergman... I don't know if you are familiar with the movie The Insider that uh, stars Al Pacino and Russell Crowe. Yeah. It's about Jeffrey. It's about mm. Jeffrey Weidbach and Philip Morris exposing Philip Morris to cigarette industry. Mm -hmm. Lowell Bergman, uh, he was the one that broke that case. But Lowell contacted me and said, Richard, we want to we wanna tell your story on 60 Minutes. And Lowell came and uh, stayed with me for a week and uh, basically uh, did all the research and then Mike Wallace flew out and uh, I was introduced to Mike Wallace then. And that relationship continued, right? Wasn't he present at some of the uh, the trials that went on or the hearings that went on uh, regarding yeah. the corruption? Yeah. Yes, he, uh, he, he uh, after uh, Mike interviewed me, you know, I told him that my father was sick back in New York. He was in his late 70s, uh, and uh, he, was, he wasn't doing good, and he was scared for me. And uh, Mike took me to a phone, and he called my father in the middle of the night, and he assured my dad that, you know what, what, what his son did was very heroic, and that 60 Minutes would have his back. Hmm. And um, that began my relationship with Mike Wallace. It's a beautiful story. Now, was there ever a time when you regretted speaking up? Um, I, I, I never regretted speaking up. I never regretted doing what I did. And to this day, I haven't regretted it because it stopped the violence. It changed the system for the better. And, and uh, I realized that, you know what? Um, lives were saved. Many, many lives were saved because they no longer put those inmates out there together. They're in single cages now. So at the end of the day, was, we have to live with ourselves. And uh, I hold my head high. I tell my story in the public. I don't walk around fearing anybody. The good cops out in society and the good people out in society have embraced me. Um, I, I, I was able to live with myself. And at the end of the day, that's what's important is can you live with yourself? And when it came to me, I mean, I could accept that if an inmate did something to a staff member, that inmate knew there were going to be repercussions. But I would be damned if we're going to set inmates up and we're going to take human life 
just to be part of the crew, uh, part of that, the good old boys. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I stopped that. I stopped that. So uh -huh. at the end of the day, I had no regrets because I saved many lives, and uh, I can look at myself in the mirror and be proud of that. Yeah, good for you, man. I mean, that's um, definitely a wonderful, um, courageous thing that you did. Now, how long was it before your war with the authorities got resolved? Because I've spoken to you before, and I know that this wasn't just a question of you saying, hey, this is happening, and it was accepted, that it went on for a long time. You had to stand up against the authorities. I came forward in 1994, and it concluded in 2001. So you're talking seven years of continuing to walk around, especially inside the prisons where I had to still work, not knowing if today the day that I'm going to be killed. So the, 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 the irony of the story is, though, the people that you think are the bad guys, the Mexican Mafia, the Aryan Brotherhood, the Black Gorilla family, these inmates that have betrayed to be these monsters, they're the ones that put a protective circle around me because they couldn't believe that a cop stood up to stop the violence of their people. So that's the irony of the story is the people that you think are the bad guys were able to protect me inside that prison environment and they refused to let anything happen to me. So how how did they actually intervene? How were they able to protect you? Well, because the the guards that were involved, I was told that you know a hit had been put on me, and I had the heads of the Mexican mafia and uh, the Aryan Brotherhood. They would they would stop it. They would go up to they would make sure that nothing would happen to me because if you cross one of those individuals that are running those gangs, you'll be killed. So if they got wind that anything was going to happen to Caruso, they squashed it. So mm. you, you don't, ex number one, you don't exist inside that prison setting without those gangs allowing you. You got to figure when you're out there on the main yard, there's three officers on the ground. There's a thousand inmates on the ground and there's one gunner up in the gun tower. So you got three officers on the ground with no weapons, just a side hand of time. I guess a thousand inmates. Who do you think is running that yard? Mm -hmm. The only thing they fear, the only thing they fear, and they really don't even fear that, is that gunman up in that tower, because lots of times they don't even fear getting shot. So they were the ones that they allow us to walk amongst them because of the numbers. Well, I remember when I watched the movie, and I know that the movie. Um, it's strong, but it definitely doesn't depict uh, the full um, force of, of what you went through. But there was a very powerful moment in there when the inmates in that movie all stood. They basically formed a human shield against uh, someone being killed. And, and that was that was a very memorable moment. Can you describe your experience with Hollywood? Um, basically... The way Hollywood works is kind of unfortunate because back in the 50s and 60s, Hollywood had great screenwriters. Uh, they wrote movies like Citizen Kane and, you know, just great writers. And now Hollywood is being run by a lot of uh, young adults in their 30s that you see a lot of remakes. You see a lot of uh, animation movies. You see movies being made, part one, part two, part three. And a lot of movies, they just open up the newspaper or go on TV and base it on a true story. It's a lazy way. It's a lazy way. And the great writers have kind of been, you know, a thing of the past. So my being that my story was, you know, in the, in the, in the news constantly, in our 60 Minutes, Hollywood approached me and said, the Paramount Pictures approached me and said, you know, we would like to buy your rights and possibly make this movie. But just if they buy your rights doesn't mean that your movie is going to get made. They just own your rights, and they it's called optioning you. So Paramount Pictures optioned my rights for two years, and I sold my life rights to them for two years, and nothing happened. And then I got my rights back. And then I went back to Hollywood, and I'm with my agent, and we went around all the major studios, 
and we did what was called the dog and pony show where you get 15 minutes with these studios from, uh, you know, from Universal to Disney to all these studios, you're meeting with them and you go in there and you tell them who you are and you give them, you know, you know, uh, a little synopsis of your story and they can either buy your rights or they can pass. Well, Universal Studios bought my rights again for two years, but this time a guy by the name of Casey Silver, he assigned, he assigned a uh, screenwriter by the name of David Chisholm to write a script about my story. So I was like, well, maybe my movie's going to get made because they paid him, you know, they paid him well to write a script. And uh, the script was named Judgment. Uh, that was the name of the script. And then at the time, I thought my movie was going to get made, but then uh, 9-11 happened, and instead of making my movie, they made Universal made G. Lee with Ben Affleck and J-Lo, and it bombed, and they made Ladder 49. Well, I got my rights back again. So then what happened is Michael Jackson was on trial down in Los Angeles for child molestation. And uh, if he was found guilty, he was going to that high-profile unit at Corcoran State Prison. And there was a show called The Dan Abrams Report on MSNBC. And uh, I was in uh, South Carolina at the time, and I was via satellite being interviewed on The Dan Abrams Report. And he was interviewing me basically saying, if Michael Jackson is found guilty, He's coming to you, Richard. What will his daily life be? And I was talking on TV about what Michael will face at Corcoran and what his daily routine will be. Well, a director had saw that and said, that's Richard Caruso from 60 Minutes, got a hold of MSNBC. MSNBC got a hold of me, hooked me and the director up. Within two days, he flew to South Carolina. And that night, we were writing um, – a theme, uh, a storyline on index cards on a hotel bed about the movie Felon. Two years later, we made the movie. Mm. You were on the set all the time, weren't you? That's correct. I'm also a producer. I was one of the producers. I acted now, in it. Yeah, I, I, I saw the film. And uh, where were you in the movie? Uh, right when he enters the prison... Um, his first arrival at the prison, I'm the one that is interviewing him about the uh, sticking that happened on the bus, wanting him to give up information. Hmm. I'm going to go back and look at it again. <laughs> Richard, today, what drives your purpose and passion? Well, um, making the movie fell in and what happened in Corcoran and going through all the, the years of fighting the system in California, I realized that just doesn't define who I am. And I needed to find another purpose-driven life because, you know, that was something that I did back then, but that's, it doesn't define who I am. And what I do today is I go out and I, and I, and I try to help veterans. I, 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 I assist veterans in any way that I can. I go all over the world and honor veterans. So I'm I'm a big veteran advocate, and um, I'm in, in the next week, Prince Harry is coming over here to the United States with three British veterans, and they picked three Americans, and they've also asked me to come along, and we're going to Los Angeles, and we're doing what's called the Walk Across America. It's four months, one thousand miles, and I'm about to go on a journey with Prince Harry, it's charity, walking with the wounded, and I leave. June 1st for that journey. So my new purpose in life is giving back to veterans and helping them with their PTSD and just extending my hand and shaking hands and squeezing necks and loving on my veteran brothers and sisters. That's beautiful. That's very exciting. Where does your journey begin when you begin walking? We start in Los Angeles. Uh, if you go on, if you're on Facebook and you go walking with the wounded, You'll be able to see all the information, and you'll be able to follow us. And we go uh, all throughout the states. We're going to be up in D.C. Uh, we're going to be um, we're going to end our journey ends. Uh, it starts June second on the USS Iowa, and um, it ends September seventh, walking into Ground Zero. So it will be on. I'm sure it'll be nationally covered on a lot of the news channels. And uh, it's going to be a beautiful journey, a beautiful thing. We're going to be 
we're going to be squeezing a lot of hands and hugging a lot of necks. And uh, I will say that Prince Harry and Prince William from over there, over in Britain and UK, they, they love their veterans as we love our veterans over here in the United States. And I'm just so excited to team up with uh, the team from the UK and, 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 and take this journey. You said a thousand miles, but what you just described is more than 3,000 miles. Right. It's just, it's just a thousand miles they're going to do. If you go on walking with the wounded and you'll be able to see the route, it's almost like a, uh, it's almost like a, a rock tour as far as a, like a, like a rock band. I mean, we're in different cities every day. And, uh, the National Football League, Wounded Warriors of America, and Land Rover are the ones that are sponsoring this. So we're going to be, uh, we got there's six walkers and then there's, uh, 10 people of support staff. I'm one of the support staff that will be traveling with them. So we're going to be going to all the major cities and, uh, we're going to be, uh, I, you know, I can't list all the cities that I have to pull up the route, but if you go on walking with the wounded, you'll be able to get all the information on that. But you say you start in Los Angeles and you end up at Ground Zero, which is in New York, right? That's right, yes. Well, that's over 3,000 miles. That's around 2,640 miles, right. I don't I don't know how they come up with 1,000 miles because what happened was, the, the way that I got involved with this was three years ago, I had a Marine contact me from Texas. And he sent me a fa uh, message on Facebook. He says, Richard Crusoe, you don't know me, but I'm your Marine brother, and uh, I'm in a dark place. He goes, I got back from Iraq, and he said, uh, life is just not stimulating enough for me. I lost my purpose. I don't have my brothers anymore. He goes, I don't even know if I want to live anymore. He goes, but Crusoe, when I get up in the morning and get my coffee, I look at your Facebook, and I see you hugging the necks of veterans, and it brings a smile to my face. He said, I would like to start doing that. And I said, well, I said, Larry, I said, you can do that. I said, just get out there, brother, and, you know, put the bottle down and, you know, stop your drinking and get out there and just be, put put good out there and good will come back. And he said, well, Richard, I sure would like to talk to you again. Is there any way I could call you again? Because I'm going to come up with something to honor veterans. And I said, sure, you know, you can call me again. And uh, I hung up the phone and never thought I'd hear from that Marine again. But four months later, he called me back and he said, Richard, he goes, can you meet me at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina on April 2nd? And I said, uh, yeah. I said, what's going on? He goes, I'm going to walk across America. I'm going to walk 2,640 miles. I'm going to start at Camp Lejeune and I'm going to end at Camp Pendleton in Oceanside, California. He goes, I'm going to walk 22 miles a day, six days a week for seven months. And I go, Larry, if you do that, I'll have veterans watching over you all the way across America. Well, I'll be damned if Larry didn't do that. I went to Camp Lejeune April 2nd. I walked the first couple miles with him. We had a police escort and Marines walking with us. He walked 2,640 miles. He fed over 1,000 veterans along his path. November 8th of last, or two years ago, November 8th, I flew into Oceanside, California. I walked the last five miles with Larry Hinkle. Sergeant Larry Hinkle, into over 2,000 Marines standing at the position of attention waiting for us to walk into them, and they all embraced us as we came to the end. Then after that, I pulled him back to Texas. We went from we went from California to Arizona, from Arizona to New Mexico, from New Mexico to Texas for five weeks, all along that route, stopping at veterans' homes, living on veterans. So then he got back to Texas, and he was hoping that someone had noticed his journey because he wanted to get a major sponsor to sponsor him so he could do this, you know, go out to VA and love our veterans. Well, no one, no one got a hold of him. So he started slipping back into that dark hole. And I said, brother, listen, just keep putting good out there and good will come back. So two months ago, he called me. He said, Richard, you're not going to believe what happened. And I said, what happened? He said, I just got a call from Wounded Warriors down in Florida and Prince Harry is coming over here after he gets married with three British veterans. And they are picking three American veterans to go on what's called the Walk Across America. And they picked me as one of them. And I was so thrilled because he was the seed off of my tree. 
And I was just, I, I mean, I had tears in my eyes. I was so thrilled that Larry got picked. So then one week later, I got a call from Buckingham Palace asking if this was Richard Caruso, and I said, yes, it is. They said, Sergeant Larry Hinkle has given us your name, and we, were, we are asking you if you would like to come along on this journey as a volunteer. And I grabbed it. I jumped on board. I said, absolutely, I would love to come. And mm. that's when I'm leaving on June. On June 1st, I'm flying out. Wow. Now, uh, Prince Harry will be coming over. But, I mean, he won't be walking with you guys. For security reasons, but you can't tell us exactly when he'll be along the route, but he'll pop in and out. You know? Right. They, yeah, they're not going to tell us when he's going to be there, but obviously for security reasons. Of course, of course, yeah. That is that is a wonderful story. And this guy's name is Larry, you said? Larry? Sergeant, Sergeant Larry Hinkle, United States Marine Sergeant Larry Hinkle. H I. We're going to walk. H I N C K L E. Okay. H I N. And if you go on Facebook under Walking with the Wounded, you'll be able to see everything that's happening. Beautiful. Richard, where do you see yourself in five years? Uh, probably, uh, probably sitting next to uh, uh, a veteran that uh, is dealing with uh, some inner demons with my arm around his neck telling him that things are going to be okay and uh, him looking at me with tears in his eyes and uh, bonding with that veteran and uh, helping him any way I can. That's why I find satisfaction is uh, helping uh, our brothers and sisters that have served. I get a lot of uh, satisfaction out of helping them. And once they see that you speak their language, they open up to you. And, um, and I, I get a lot of joy out of helping people like that. Absolutely wonderful vision. Do you have a favorite book? Um, I, I do have a favorite book. Um, the book is the book is called The Great Santini. I don't know if you've ever read it. They made a movie about it with Robert Duvall. I saw the movie. And, yeah. Uh, well, in 1982, I was standing on the main gate of Paris Island as a military policeman, and I'm standing there in my dress blues. I'm 19 years old and this big Cadillac pulls up to me and this guy smoked a cigar and I noticed he had a blue sticker so I saluted him. The blue sticker signified he was a Marine Corps officer and he said good morning Marine. I said good morning sir. He said where are you from Marine? I said I'm from New York sir and he goes god damn Yankee. He <laughs> goes well you have a good day. He goes you have a good day Yankee like that. I said you too sir and he, and he went through the next day, that Cadillac pulls up again. And uh, big white guy smoking that cigar, and he goes, hey, Yankee, I got something for you. And I said, okay, sir, just pull your car right up there, and I'll come up and talk to you. So he pulls his car over to the side, and I go up to him. I go, sir, may I help you? He goes, hey, Yankee. He goes, I, I, I got this book for you, and I, and I wrote something in the book for you. And... Uh, and he said, I just want you to know you look damn good in those dress blues and to be proud that you're a United States Marine. But if anyone ever asks you who gave you this book, you tell them that the best damn Marine fighter pilot came through your gate and his name's the Great Santini. And it was the Great Santini that gave me the book, Colonel Conroy. Whoa. That's a fabulous yeah. story, man. As a matter of fact, I'm holding the book in my hand. And uh, he wrote a big old paragraph in the book, and I'll read you what it says. Mm -hmm. It says, The Great Santini, February 2nd, 1984. Richard Crusoe, this is your one-year anniversary of Paris Island, South Carolina, which is the home of those real Marines. San Diego is a country club compared to Paris Island, the Hollywood platoon. So those that went to the West Coast, those Marines are... A wee suspect. Just joking, but I want Richard to be able to say that he had it tough. I will not mention that you are from upstate New York. Best to you, Lieutenant Don Conroy, the great Santini. Mm, love that. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's, a, that's a precious treasure of mine. So I was going to ask if you have a favorite quote. Is that it? <laughs> I think one of my favorite quotes is, uh, it is what it is. It is what it is. What does it mean to you? 
No, I just think that, you know, lots of times in life we look for excuses, we look for reasons, and uh, we just have to uh, accept that sometimes it is what it is. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there, is no, there, is, there is no explanation. You know, everyone has a different viewpoint of why. And sometimes just because your viewpoint is different than mine, we might both be right, but it is what it is. You know, a lot of people do not like our president, uh, Trump. You know, so, uh, some do, some don't. It is what it is. He's our president. Right, exactly. Everyone has a different story, a different story about the world and about life. If you could wave a magic wand and change just one thing in the world, what would that one thing be? Oh, that's a powerful question. Um, I, 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 I still see how people are being suppressed around the world. And uh, if, if I could give them a, a democratic society in which they would all have the essentials of clean water and food on their on the table at night where you know they're not eating rice and bread I think that I would try to go with the world hunger or, or, or water clean water for everybody and uh, I mean if I could if I could wave that magic wand and get everybody health give everybody a, a, you know their health I would do that so many things I would like to just, you know. That's wonderful. That is very, you know, it's in keeping with who you are. Now, uh, I don't, I mean, I ask, always ask my guests, how can people contact you? But do you want to be contact, contacted? Um, they, if they want to go through Facebook, they can contact me and send me a message. And I'll try to uh, respond if they refer to this interview. Uh, I will. I'll, I'll know who they are. That they heard the interview and that they have a little background on me. But uh, they can also go through you, and uh, if they want to get a hold of me, um, you know, being a whistleblower and uh, being doing the right thing in life. You know, lots of us come to that fork in the road, and lots of us, uh, you know, we struggle with that decision. You know, think of the doctors in, in the in the operating rooms that have a patient that's 70 years old and says, you know what, he's not going to have a good, he has maybe six more months, but it's not going to be a good quality of life. And they put him to sleep and they tell his family that he didn't make it. I mean, if I saw that, could I, could I keep my mouth shut if I was a nurse or could I say, you know, that's wrong. That's not your decision to put that 70 year old man to sleep. That's his decision and the family's decision. So, Many times in our professions, our selected professions, we come to that fork in the road. Fortunately for me, it was all about what could I live with. And I always looked at those guards and those ovens where the Jews were marched into those ovens, and I said to myself, how could those SS members just stand there and watch that? And I just knew that I would never be a part of that. If I could make a difference, at the end of the day, I would have to live, live with myself. And unfortunately, what happens when you're a whistleblower, if it's not newsworthy and uh, you don't have the power of the press, many times you're consumed financially by the big monster that you're fighting, whether it's a company or, uh, you know, government. Uh, Many times whistleblowers don't make it in the end. They get consumed. They get exhausted financially. They go bankrupt. They lose everything. I was very fortunate to have the the ear in, uh, of the public and the, and the pulse of the public in which my, my, what I was coming forward on um, was of a public interest. And so I had the backing of the public and the press. And I had the power of the press. And so I was very fortunate. And my heart goes out to whistleblowers or people that want to do the right thing, but they end up losing everything because they didn't have what I had. So I think... Uh, You know, to summarize this interview or to summarize my story is my heart goes out to someone that wants to do the right thing but is scared because they're going to lose everything. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's about, is it about materialistic things or about being able to live with yourself? For me, I sacrificed all the materialistic things, my house, my boat, my family. I didn't care. I lost it all. And I had to be able to live with myself. And then in the end, God provided all that stuff back to me. 
Wow. You know, um, I usually ask, what are your final thoughts? But you just gave them. And uh, I want to thank you so much for your contribution today to the show, to the listeners, to the world. Well, I want to thank you for contacting me and showing your interest in my story, Lewis. And like I, you had mentioned that they can watch it on Netflix. I'm not sure if it's still on Netflix, but it is on Amazon. So if they want to watch Felon, and uh, they can definitely get it on Amazon. And uh, I, I hope they uh, enjoy the movie, but the, please understand that the movie is not as good as the true story, and I would recommend them Googling Richard Caruso, Corcoran Prison, that's C-O-R-C-O-R-A-N Prison, then watching the movie, and then they'll understand better of mm. how the movie is based around my life. Mm. Thank you again. Thank you once again, storytellers, for spending a very, very special hour with me and Richard Caruso. I don't know about you, but I feel like I have lived through several powerful real-life movies. When Richard was telling his story and his stories, I kept seeing the possibility for different feature films. I'm not talking about movies just there to titillate and entertain, but powerful films that would reveal something about the way people think, how people define meaning, and films that tell us about ways to live and about the world that we try to make sense of every single day. This one is definitely one that you must pay forward. They're all worthy of being paid forward. But take a few moments and let your friends know, let the world know, share this on social media, that they can hear this show on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, TuneIn Radio, and at the website changeyourstorypodcast.com. Definitely take advantage of the gift you'll find at the website, a free, downloadable, game-changing, life-changing ebook, Storytelling Secrets for a Rich Life and Business. And definitely take advantage of the offer from our sponsor, Audible, for a downloadable free audiobook of your choice, plus one month free trial of all of Audible services, you get to choose your book from more than 180,000 titles. Go to www.audibletrial.com forward slash story power. Do me a favor, please. This is another great way to ensure that more people find this podcast. Go to iTunes, find the title, Change Your Story, Change Your Life, and leave a brief review. Today's interview, you can talk about a powerful takeaway that you got from listening to Richard Caruso, and also leave a rating for the show. Thank you in advance for doing that. Richard said so many memorable things in this particular interview today. One of the themes that stands out for me is the power of the stories that we choose, consciously or unconsciously, to define who we are. Richard made some very difficult choices in his life, frightening choices, choices that could have ended his life, but didn't. The result was that he was able to hold his head high, as he still does today. Ask yourself during the next week, is there any story in my life that is defining me in a way that perhaps I'm not that proud of? And then look inside you, because you will definitely find the strength and the courage to change that story and to define yourself in a way that you deserve, in a way that enriches and elevates your life 
and begin by asking, how can I change my story and change my life? Tune in to the next episode of Luis DiBianco's podcast. Become unstoppable as you learn to change your story, change your life.